Um, we offer career paths, Stephen, as you were saying, um, and what we're trying to do is get into the high schools and the junior highs um, and encourage that this is a good career path. It's okay to be a welder. You can go out and make $65,000 a year and not be educated. Some people aren't set up for it. Just mentally, they, they don't have the uh, desires to go to college, and what we're trying to say is that's okay. Um, you were talking about how before everybody thought you had to go to college. I'm gonna be the first to tell you, I'm one when I'm in high schools, I'm saying it's all right that you don't have to go to college. Um, there's great career paths for us. I have some of my top level VPs that are uh, not college educated. We do post training, um, I believe in that. I think that's great. Um, but I'm gonna tell you, at the end of the day, yes, we, we do have a concern. We live in a, a area that has less than 5% unemployment and try to go hire 2,500 people. Um, it's gonna be a challenge. That's pretty much the unemployed, but I'll say those are the ones that don't wanna work um, in, where we live. And we are getting yeah, really um, recruited by other states that are saying, come to me and we can do this and we can do that. Um, and obviously we're a Louisiana company, we wanna stay here. Um, but those are some big concerns for us. One thing I think that's lacking, you know, you can look at which evaluating factor, when you're gonna hire somebody, um, and some of the weaknesses I see. Um, and this sounds very basic. I need a good hard worker. That's what I need. I need somebody that's going to listen, that's going to be a hard worker, that's trainable. Um, and we'll hire you in with no skills, and we'll train you. And I, that goes for every level. If you come in, I don't care if you come out of college, that doesn't mean you're going to be a, you're going to graduate in engineering and you're going to better design my next Coast Guard boat. There's obviously some training that needs to happen. But we need hard workers. Um, and a lot of that gets back down to the families. Uh, we are a company that encourages nepotism. I like to say that I know your mom and dad. I think that's important. Um, it's, it creates a standard of, um, and an expectation. And, and for me, I could kind of plug people where I think that they have a, a great chance to, to grow. So it's a big concern for us. Um, there's no doubt about uh, the need for, to me, both sides to be aligned. We need the higher education piece, no question. Um, with this contract, we're probably gonna need to hire 150, 200 more engineers. Um, and you try to bring those to Lafouche Parish, it's pretty tough. Um, so that's another thing I think we need to do a better job of is, is selling ourselves, you know, and I know we have people in here from Shreveport and, and areas um, with, with higher unemployment. Um, I've always been an advocate of if, if it was me and I didn't have a job, where would I go to work and have stability? Um, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, I'm say south of I-10, also north of I-10, but we're struggling right now as, as a southern corridor, if you want to call it that, uh, to recruit and retain those type of people. Um, I could go on and on about this, but that's my. Uh, will be, uh, you know, a open uh, recruiting and almost like an NFL draft or something for engineers. Well, to some extent, we're, we're there today. <clears throat> I mean, when you look at what's happening in uh, the industrial sector and some of these huge projects that have been announced, the, the biggest bottleneck is, is not permitting, it's not even skilled labor at the moment. The biggest bottleneck today uh, is the availability of engineers, the engineers that are needed to actually design these facilities. And it's not a shortage just in Louisiana, it's literally a global shortage. There's so many uh, huge projects that are envisioned, not just here on the Gulf Coast, but around the world. There are not enough engineers worldwide to meet that demand. As we look at the, the years ahead, and the same thing, by the way, is true of computer science and software development folks. That's one of the reasons why we think, as you, as you look at higher education, everything that higher education does is important to workforce development. But there are a few fields that would have a, a disproportionately large impact on the overall growth of the state if they were able to grow. Engineering is one of those fields. Computer science is also one of those fields. So if you're telling young people they're going in, they're thinking about a college, <coughs> college degree, so these are the areas you would encourage them to go into. Let's talk about the STAR program and, and the WISE. Well, I, I, think, well. I think one thing, I think Kurt and I would both agree on this, someone shouldn't just pursue a particular field because you know, it, it pays well, there's lots of jobs there. Going off of the presentation earlier, I think for someone to be successful, they need to enjoy that work. But what I do think uh, we can do a better job of is not only uh, growing those, those fields that have the greatest potential to create job growth, but also helping better inform uh, students at, at every uh, step of the way what the job opportunities are, what they pay, what kind of education that you need to get there. Well, how are we going to do that? Inform well, them along the way. I, I, there's a number of ways to do that. You mentioned one, the STAR job system. Um, part of our goal, well, really our mission is to put people to work. But if you look at it from the employer side, not just the individual side, um, 
we're, we're here to fill jobs. Okay, so the way to do that is to make sure that people understand what those jobs are, where they are, and those qualities that Stephen mentioned, but also the other qualities that, that help you determine if you're going to enjoy that work. But then you've also got to understand what the pathway is to that job. And, you know, a few years ago, we, you know, we were doing a lot of forecasting work in our department, um, but it was impenetrable. And even you know, higher education leaders couldn't really penetrate those terrible spreadsheets. And I was telling King Alexander a little while ago that the, the most high-ranking job for demand was ticket takers, like in movie theaters. But there's, you know, there's lots of jobs with lots of churn that have real, no real value to growing the economy or to people's ability to sustain themselves. So the star job system isn't just what's in demand, but it's what are the valuable jobs that are in demand. So it looks at how much they grow, how fast they grow, what they pay, those kinds of factors. Um, but also connects people directly to the pathway to get that job, to, to who, who will produce, help them attain the credential, the qualification to be employed in that job. And it's a mobile app, so it's very accessible. The key thing in, in getting that word out, high schools know about it now. Colleges know about it. Several uh, institutions have a link to it from their websites and there's all kinds of marketing going on. So it's a mobile app, it's called? Louisiana Star Jobs. Louisiana Star mm -hmm. Jobs. Yep, go to laworks.net on any computer and kick on, uh, click on the big blue star. All right, so that's communicating, because clearly, lots of times, we who are in certain fields talk to one another, and the general public doesn't really know what you're let talking let about. Let me say, many people in this room help develop that system. Right. And they help put the information in it to keep it current. So keeping current information is critical, is it not? You can have technology, but if somebody goes to it once and it's outdated, it doesn't help. Right, it's, it's refreshed all the time. All right, so Stephen, um, as you look out, I've heard many business people say to me, I can't find good workers. I just, I can't find them. There's, uh, they aren't the soft skills we were talking about earlier. Uh, maybe there is drug testing problem too. I mean, is that something you're still encountering? Absolutely. I think, you know, Ben said it very well. I mean, he, you want someone that can work hard. And when you hear soft skills a lot, the, the, the people, the membership that I talk to, they mention basic education, technical training, soft skills, and then pass a drug test. Um, you know, I think it's probably a different panel, a longer discussion to talk about the drug <laughs> test piece. But uh, on the soft skills piece, depending on the company you're talking to, it means different things. For some companies, it is simply, can you show up for work on time? Will you be there, and will you be able to work well with a coworker and work well with a customer without alienating them? It's that simple. Some, it's a little more complex. Some say, I need someone who can lead a panel discussion, who can work a whiteboard, who knows how to use PowerPoint, who can you know, put together a strategic plan. All those things are soft skills. Um, and again, 90% of our members say soft skills are just as important as the technical piece, which is a surprising number to me. They just want someone who can show up and work hard and meet that demand. But the other piece is, the jobs of tomorrow are going to require math and critical thinking no matter what you do. If you want to go work in the same factory your dad and your grandfather did, you're going to need those skills. If you want to be an engineer, you're going to need those skills. If you want to be an attorney in the future, you're going to need those skills. I think those are the, that's the feedstock for the new economy. And that's where we are today. We're no longer competing town versus town, you know, north versus south. It is us versus the world, us versus other states. I think Stephen <laughs> reminds us of that every week in the paper um, because it's true. And the sooner we embrace that and attack that, that's when we can start stealing market share from other folks. And that is, in, in our K-12 system, why I think it's so important. We're 48th and 50th in math and reading, and the U.S. is 17th and 26th in those categories. So we're one of the worst states in our country that's middle of the pack at best if it's an industrialized peers. And that's the environment we're competing in. And so if we teach those skills in the K-12 system, we can create all the great post-secondary programs we want. If we're not getting the feedstock right, it's not going to work. And so I think one of the things, and, and King Alexander, when he came here, one of the first things he did is he went and met with the State Superintendent Association. And I think those types of steps are fantastic. You know, to, to connect the dots between, you know, we always talk about business and higher ed needs to work closer together. Absolutely, we've got to do that. And I think it has improved a lot. But I'll also say the downstream piece is just as important because a program only works as well as the student's preparation for success inside of it. And so that's why we focused our efforts on K-12 as much as on the post-secondary side. Well, gentlemen, and I, I do say gentlemen, you are all males up here. And one of our challenges, we have a lot of women in the workforce. 
and we have trouble getting women going into the science fields. This has been one thing throughout my career. I was at the generation where my father said, you can be a teacher or a nurse before you get married if you have to work. Where you're now, everyone's working. And I guess I would say to you, how do you attract, in the STEM fields especially, uh, a large percentage of our work for female workforce? I'm going to ask you men that question. What do you say to your daughters or your wives or whatever? Or your workers? I have a daughter who's in a STEM field at LSU. Um, but I'll tell you, tell me, I don't know if she's going to get a job out of it because she's in kinesiology <laughs> and apparently everybody's in kinesiology. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, those of you from uh, LSU, but is it not true that there are more women math majors today than there are men math majors? So I take that as not, not anything to say, you know, the battle's been won, but certainly that there's been a lot of progress made in that. And I'll tell you that the companies that, that I deal with most directly, most often, um, talk about the need to recruit women. And these are companies that are the construction companies that will be building all of these plants, all the way through to more high-tech companies, that they have an internal focus on making sure that women understand that their jobs are accessible, that there's no barrier that they're putting into place, at least not knowingly, um, that would prevent women from going to work for them. Uh, but key things, I think, are just making sure that women and other underrepresented populations are included in the marketing material, the recruitment materials um, for jobs, and I think that that will help drive women into, the, into those programs in school. And mentoring, perhaps, is one of the things Absolutely. we heard about as well. No? For every, every group, for white males, for women, for minorities, for everybody. Anybody else reaction? I would just add that communication is such a huge part of it, as Kurt touched yeah. on. Uh, when you look at corporate America today, most of the companies that I interact with are eager to develop a more diverse workforce, uh, more females in technical positions, more minorities and so forth. Um, folks that pursue um, high impact technical fields like engineering, like computer science, that are women, that are minorities, I think particularly today, more than maybe any time in our history, uh, are going to find themselves in great demand uh, in Louisiana and across the country. We just need to help them understand those opportunities are out there. 